We're here to uh, hear Brother Dan Black from the Brooklyn Bethel, and he's going to speak to us on this subject. Defend yourself against Satan's secret weapon. Brother Black, please. I knew a man once, in fact, I knew him very well, who had an extremely low opinion of himself. And I venture to say that very few people who knew him would ever have guessed that that was the case. Uh, you wouldn't see it to know him. He seemed full of confidence, certainly full of life and joy. Uh, he was a very um, a charming person. He was somebody that naturally, in a group of people, he just naturally kind of took the lead. People looked to him. People enjoyed his sense of humor. He was very funny. He also happened to be extraordinarily good-looking, a very handsome young man. It was kind of um, a strange experience to be in his company for me as a teenager, awkward as I was. And um, women he had never met would approach him, would pass him notes. I remember one woman he uh, happened across in Europe, um, traveled all the way to New York City just in the hopes of meeting him again. And yet of all the good qualities that he had, desirable qualities, the best of them was that he loved Jehovah. He had a spiritual side to him. And the tragedy of the story is that it was that, the best part of him, that he lost. As many do, he became involved in wrongdoing. And when the brothers were working with him and encouraging him and trying to get him to change his ways and continue trying, I remember I too was talking to him at, those time, at that time. And I remember him saying to me, I'm no good. Why bother? Why even try? And he stopped bothering. He stopped trying. And he gave up. And he no longer serves Jehovah. As I mentioned, I knew him well then. But now, 20-some years later, I can say I barely know him at all. And yet, this man I'm describing is my own brother. Now, you might have guessed by the way I've described him, he's not my identical twin. But um, <laughs> I'm not sure why you're laughing. But... Uh, the Bible says that even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. But um, <laughs> I'm sure that I'm not the only person in this room who has someone we love and care about, who has left the way of the truth and has stopped serving Jehovah. And I'm fairly confident that, I'm, that my brother is not the only case where that kind of thinking played a role, it played some contributing role in the person leaving Jehovah. How often do we see that, where people think, I'm no good. Uh, I'm, I'm, no one loves me. No one could care about me. I'm not worth it. I'm not worth anyone's time. Even Jehovah could never really love me. And in the years since then, I, I've thought about that a lot. I've thought about that kind of thinking. And I've come to think of it as Satan's secret weapon because it is very powerful. And it is often very well hidden. You'll find that kind of thinking sometimes in the last person you would suspect uh, to be thinking that way. And Satan's weapon, why? Because it's dangerous. And spiritually it can be poisonous. It can be lethal. Uh, just to illustrate why this kind of thinking is so, is so dangerous and so powerful. Uh, just imagine a brother gets a brand new car. And you know how brothers are with their brand new car. Sorry to be sexist, but this is so often the case. And he's got this beautiful car with that perfect finish on it. And his wife asks him to, to take her to the mall to go shopping. Now, where does he park? Why are you laughing? You know, right? Does he park right close to the entrance of the mall so that his wife can carry her things right? To, oh, no. He's way, he's almost in another state, right? He's way, way out in the corner. And his wife is furious. Why? Because he doesn't want someone to park near his car and open their door and get a ding and that perfect, beautiful finish on his car. Isn't that true? And yet, after that car has had a few fender benders, and he's had it for some years, and there are rust spots and bends and dings and so forth to it, does he take the same care of it? No, he might even leave the keys in it, leave it unlocked, hoping that someone will steal it and he'll collect the insurance, right? Similarly, the wife goes into the mall and buys a beautiful blouse, a silk blouse, a very expensive one. And the first few times she wears it, she wears it out to a nice restaurant perhaps, or she saves it for special occasions. And she's so careful of it, not to do anything that will damage it or, or put a spot on it. She may even wrap a napkin around her neck and ruin the look of the blouse just to get through the meal without putting a spot on this lovely garment, right? But let's say 
there is an indelible spot on it. Maybe somehow some ink got on it. She can't get the spot out. Does she take the same care of that blouse after that? No, it might well go in the rag bag, isn't it true? She may wipe the windows with it. What's happened? You see, if we view ourselves as dinged, dented, damaged, worthless, unloved, unlovable, will we take the same care of ourselves to keep ourselves protected against the efforts of this world to change us and sway us in our morals? No, we won't. So it's a dangerous kind of thinking. To view ourselves as worthless, as hopelessly ruined or damaged or unloved or uncared for, it is profoundly dangerous uh, to think that way. So we're going to talk about it this afternoon. And really we're going to discuss three aspects of the subject. Number one is, how do people get convinced of such a harmful and false idea? Secondly, and the bulk of this talk is about how to fight it how to fight back against it. And then third, we're going to talk briefly about what is the real value of having a balanced view of ourselves. What can that do for us spiritually? So let's start off with the first aspect. How do people get convinced of of such an idea that that they're, they're worthless or unloved or unlovable? Well, it can start very, very early in life. In fact, it can start at birth. Uh, When David, for example, was profoundly disturbed over some terrible mistakes he had made, What did he say in Psalm 51? Psalm 51, verse 5, here he speaks out of the absolute abject misery he has brought on himself, right? And he notes a a truth about all of us. He says, look, Psalm 51, verse 5, look, with error I was brought forth with birth pains, and in sin my mother conceived me. David recognized that part of the reason he went the way he did was that he's a sinful man. And that the sin started at birth. In fact, he says, in sin, my mother conceived me, right? Sin goes back all the way to Adam and Eve. And we're born with it, as David saw. And David wasn't excusing his wrong course, but he recognized this is profoundly disturbing, that we have this sin tied up in us. And sometimes it contributes to us doing stupid things that we regret. Think of the Apostle Paul. We know well how he spoke about his own sinful uh, nature in Romans 7, verses 19 to 24, right? You remember that, how Paul said, the good that I wish to do, I, I don't do. He said, miserable man that I am. He struggled against his sinful tendencies. He knew well that, like David did, that they're inborn. And sometimes just facing our own weaknesses, our own imperfections, can get us very down on ourselves, can get us very discouraged, and can lead us to extremes in thinking. Uh, there's just... I'm a waste. I'm useless. I'm of no good to anybody, you see. It can contribute to that kind of thinking. So sometimes it does. It comes from within. But also, at times, it can be influenced from without as well. Sometimes we have other voices echoing those within uh, that confirm any negative feelings we have about ourselves. And tragically, sometimes those can even come from within the family. Now, it shouldn't be the case. Jehovah designed the family to be an oasis of comfort and safety and encouragement. But we know well what the Bible says about the times we're living in. We read 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 to people all the time. And when we get to that part in verse 3 where Paul said that in the last days, an aspect of these critical times is that people would have no natural affection. Now, he used a Greek word, astorgi which means without, the A means without, and then storgi, what we're studying this week in our book study, what kind of love that is, that's family love, familial love. So right there in the God's inspired word, it's saying that in the last days, families won't be the same. They are not always the haven of love and encouragement and support that Jehovah designed them to be. And so tragically, Sometimes within the family, there is a a terrible barrage of verbal abuse that goes on or just coldness, a lack of love. Sometimes there's even worse, harsh physical treatment, even sexual abuse. The list goes on and on. We're reading about it in the papers all the time. And no doubt many here have been through um, such experiences. And the faithful and discreet slave has helped us to come to grips with many of these difficulties, many of these uh, types of problems. For example, the Awake magazine some years ago, had an article uh, with this headline, Harsh Words Crushed Spirits. It it struck my interest. It was rare to see an an article from the faithful slave open with such words. It says, you stupid slowpoke. Those words are in quotes, of course. And it goes on to say that a woman in Japan remembers those words all too well. They were flung at her frequently when she was a small child. 
By whom? School children? No, by her parents. She recalls, I used to get depressed because the name calling cut me deeply. It goes on to say, a man in the United States remembers that as a child, he felt fearful and anxious whenever his father came home. Now think of it, the standard picture of the father coming home is that the kids rush to the door. They're so eager to greet daddy, right? But notice how he puts it. He says, to this day, I can still hear the sound of the tires on the driveway. And it goes through me like a chill. My little sister would hide. My father was a perfectionist and constantly browbeat us for not doing a good enough job on all the chores that we had to do. This man's sister adds, I don't remember either of my parents ever hugging us, kissing us, or saying anything like, I love you or I'm proud of you. And to a child, never hearing I love you feels the same as hearing I hate you every day of his life. So harsh words, cold, angry treatment right within the family circle. And sadly, that is not a rarity in today's world. And many, even among Jehovah's people, have grown up in, uh, in this kind of environment. It can have a profound effect on people and on the way they view themselves. But of course, even worse sometimes than words are the actions that people take. Actions sometimes teach more powerfully than words do. On the positive side, think of how Jesus kept trying to teach his followers, that they should be humble and deal humbly with one another. But it wasn't getting through. But do you remember the last way he tried to teach that lesson? He let the words go and he did actions, right? He washed their feet. He took an action that was so powerful and you can tell that it had a lasting effect on his followers. The problem wasn't going entirely, but what a powerful teaching tool, actions. Sadly, that works also on the negative side, that sometimes through actions, even in the family environment, children can be taught that they are worthless. And then we, we're talking then not only about verbal abuse, but uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, one, uh, one sister wrote in to the society, and uh, she said that she was abused by various individuals. She said, my mother, although not a party to it, failed to protect me, and later... When I told her that I was being abused by her husband, she didn't believe me or didn't care. What was the result of these actions? She says, I can remember feeling worthless and dirty all of my life, but not understanding why. She had been taught in the most powerful possible way, perhaps, that she had no value, that she was worthless. And that's a devastating, devastating lesson to be taught. And, of course, a profound lie as well. Another letter from Japan Similarly, and a woman wrote, I've always been uneasy as to how Jehovah looks at me and lock myself up in a shell thinking I'm dirty and unworthy. You see, this idea, if if, if parents were to teach such a horrible thing to a child that they're worthless or unlovable, naturally a child assumes that's how God too feels about them. And it can poison even someone's relationship with Jehovah God. What a tragedy that can be right there in the family. And, of course, the Bible acknowledges that this uh, is the way things work. The Apostle Paul, when he said, for example, in uh, Colossians 3.21, he tells fathers not to exasperate their children. He gives a reason why. He says that they may not become downhearted. Right? So that profoundly discouraging kind of thinking can get lodged in a young child's heart, feeling worthless, unloved, unlovable. And it can be long-lasting. And the Bible is saying, don't, don't let your child grow up with such ideas. And then, of course, outside the family, even in the best of families, they have to send the child off to school. (laughs) And school is another environment that is supposed to be a safe one, a nurturing one. This is the environment where they learn and are helped to uh, learn how to think and deal with problems and so forth. But as we all know, of course, school is not always the nurturing environment that it ought to be either. And teachers can have a profound effect, for good or for bad. I think of Jesus' words to the Pharisees. Here were people who set themselves up as the teachers back in Jesus' day. And Jesus said the effect of their teaching was terrible. In effect, he said in Matthew 23, 13 and 15, they were actually leading people to Gehenna. That was how terribly effective bad teaching can be, you see. And so it is today, too, of course, with teachers. If they're teaching something wrong or something harmful, oftentimes young people will absorb it and believe it, even if it's something very negative um, about themselves. I remember um, reading a very powerful article by a teacher 
who realized that this was true, realized the terrible power that sometimes is in the hands of a teacher. And I'd like to read you just some excerpts from her article. Um, this, the story is called Cipher in the Snow. And let me just read you the opening. It says, it started with tragedy on a biting, cold February morning. She says, I was driving behind the Milford Corners bus, as I did most snowy mornings on my way to school. It veered and stopped short at the hotel, which it had no business doing. And I was annoyed as I had, had to come to an unexpected stop. And I saw a boy lurch out of the bus. He reeled, stumbled, and collapsed on the snowbank at the curb. The bus driver and I reached him at the same moment. His thin, hollow face was white even against the snow. He's dead, the driver whispered. Well, he was right. The child had died. And this teacher was given the assignment of going to tell the parents about the death of the son. And she was very surprised to hear from the principal that she had been this child's favorite teacher. Why was she surprised? Because he was kind of a blank, this little boy. He was sad. He never smiled. He seemed very depressed. He very, very rarely ever spoke. And she was surprised to learn that he even remembered her because she felt bad. She could barely really even remember him. And she racked her brain trying to learn about this child and learn about well, you know, what happened to him, what was wrong with him, what contributed to his, to his death. Well, the clues started piling up. She went out to the boy's home. And um, the mother, of course, was shocked to hear that her son had died. She said he never said anything about being sick. But his stepfather just laughed, snorted. He ain't said nothing about anything since I moved in here. Well, the teacher could sense where some of the problems were coming from. But then she looked at the boy's history in the school, and the more she learned, the more disturbed she became. She said this boy, Cliff Evans, it turned out, had silently come into the school door in the mornings and had gone out the school door in the evenings, and that was all. As far as I could tell, he had never done one happy, noisy kid thing. He'd never been anybody at all. How do you go about making a boy into a zero, she asked herself. She went to the grade school records to find out how this boy managed to just kind of disappear, vanish from everybody's radar. And she said the grade school records showed her what had happened. The first and second grade teacher's annotations read, sweet, shy child, timid but eager. Then the third grade note had opened the attack. Some teacher had written in good handwriting, Cliff won't talk, uncooperative, slow learner. The other academic sheep, she says, had followed suit with words like dull, slow-witted, low IQ. She says they became correct. The boy's IQ score in the ninth grade was listed at 83, but his IQ in the third grade was 106. Think of it, 106 in third grade, 83 in ninth grade. The score didn't go under 100 until the seventh grade. She says, even shy, timid, sweet children have resilience. It takes time to break them. But that was her conclusion, was that in effect, they had broken him. They had broken his spirit by bombarding him with these persistent negative messages about himself. You're slow, you're dull, you're stupid, that you don't count, in effect. And she says, a child is a believing creature. He came to believe them. It says, suddenly, it seemed clear to me that over and over again, the faces in this boy's life had said to him, you're a nothing, Cliff Evans. So she said what she thinks happened is finally when there was nothing left at all for Cliff Evans, he collapsed on a snowbank and went away. The doctor might list heart failure as the cause of death, but that wouldn't change my mind. Now, terrible tragedy, but it had in a way a good effect on this teacher. She says, I've never forgotten that boy or the resolve that I made after that. She said, he has been my challenge year after year, class after class. I look up and down the rows carefully every September at the unfamiliar faces. I look for veiled eyes or bodies scrounged into a seat in an alien world. Look, kids, I say silently, I may not do anything else for you this year, but not one of you is going to come out of here a nobody. I'll work or fight to the bitter end doing battle with society and the school board, but I won't have one of you coming out of here thinking himself a zero. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, she says, I've succeeded. Did you have teachers like that, with that kind of commitment, that kind of dedication? 
I think maybe all of us or many of us can look back and think of, oh, yeah, you know, I can think of one dear lady, one wonderful man who really seemed to feel that way. Did they all feel that way? No, of course not. We live in a harsh and cold world. And sadly, all too many are bitter, angry people. And they unleash some of that on young people who are helpless to fight back. So sometimes, even in schools, um, negative messages about, uh, about themselves are just hammered in to, to people. And then there are all kinds of other influences that can get people thinking this way. Uh, the influence of peers, the environment, society, other factors. The truth is, we are complex creatures. And uh, the best answer to this question, how do we get to thinking this way, is we don't always know. <laughs> There's whole fields of psychiatry and psychology that may feel that they have all the answers, but generally what they seem to spend their time doing is, is correcting the views that they used to expound 10 years earlier. Uh, so really, so much about the human mind is a mystery except to the Creator. All we can see without any question is that a lot of people have been convinced of this very dangerous false teaching from Satan. So we need to move on then to the more important part. Remember our second question we're going to talk about is how do we fight back? How can we fight back against this dangerous idea that we're worthless, that we're unloved or unlovable? The good news is we can. We most certainly can. Please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes there, For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful by God, for overturning strongly entrenched things. Wonderful words and reassuring truth. Jehovah gives us spiritual weapons that can overturn strongly entrenched things. And all of us have seen this work. All of us. Because every one of us who has been active in the ministry and have been active in the Christian congregation, we have seen people who used to believe lies, and we've seen the truth overturn those lies. Sometimes people who believe lies for decades have come to see the truth, and we have watched God's word, that weapon of the truth, overturned strongly entrenched things. In my former congregation in, um, in New York City, in Brooklyn Heights, we had one woman who first started studying with Jehovah's Witnesses when she was 94 years old. She had been a Roman Catholic all of those years. And the first thing that she wanted to talk about was the Trinity. Well, the sisters studying with her showed her the Bible, read some scriptures. They talked about it for a while. And you know what? She got it. She had a quite a clear mind. <laughs> And she saw it. The truth overturned a strongly entrenched thing. Now, the Catholic priest came to see her not long after because she wasn't going to church as regularly as he wanted, and her contributions weren't coming in as regularly as he wanted. And he tried to convince her to come back to church. But she'd gotten that Trinity teaching, and she said, you teach Trinity, you go to hell. And she threw him out. <laughs> now, she didn't fully understand the teaching on hellfire yet. You see, that wasn't all resolved for her yet. But the, t the Trinity, she had gotten that, you see. So she really thought that preacher was going to go to hell for teaching the Trinity. Later she was happy to learn, of course, that there's no such thing as a hellfire. But the idea is that really the truth overturned. Here's something she believed probably for 80 years or more. And yet the truth overturned it. Can the truth overturn these ideas about ourselves? They can overturn ideas about Jehovah God. Yes, they can certainly overturn ideas about ourselves as well if they're wrong. If you turn over to 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and let's read verse 19 and 20. It says there, By this we shall know that we originate with the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him as regards whatever our hearts may condemn us in, because God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Isn't that a beautiful verse? So here the aged apostle John is, is recognizing the reality that sometimes our hearts condemn us, right? And when that happens, when we have that inner voice saying, you're useless, you're worthless, nobody cares about you, you know, you're just in the way, you're just a burden on everybody around you, that can be, feel like the heaviest weight in the world. If someone ever says, you know, I, have the, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders, perhaps that's the kind of thinking that's going through their mind. I just feel like a terribly heavy, heavy load, too heavy to carry. But here the Apostle John reassures us, he says, that God is greater than our hearts. So no matter how heavy that load feels, Jehovah is bigger. Right? He's greater than our hearts. He can lift that burden. He says here, we can assure our hearts before him. We can retrain our hearts. We can assure our hearts with the truth. So we're going to talk briefly about four truths we can use that will assure our hearts, four truths that will help us combat the lie. 
the lie that we're of no value, that we're unloved or unlovable. So four truths. Are you ready? Number one, the Bible teaches directly, directly that you have value, that you have worth. The Bible teaches it directly and very, very powerfully. Uh, Let's go to no lesser a personage than Jehovah's own son. Let's turn to Matthew 10. And just one example. Now, this is a very familiar passage, but we'll take a little bit of time on it so we can get some more of the meat out of it. Matthew chapter 10, and let's read verses 29 to 31. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Jesus says here, Do not two sparrows sell for a coin of small value? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, you can't read over those words without having kind of a warm feeling inside. This beautiful, reassuring passage. But if that's all we do, if we just read them, enjoy that little flicker of warmth and move on, we can miss so much of the value that is locked in these words. They are really worth pausing over and thinking about and gleaning the meaning that Jesus is is, uh, packed into that thought there. Uh, For example, he says in verse 29, now two sparrows sell for a coin of small value. The first thought that would occur to us if we're being curious is why on earth would anybody buy a sparrow? I I mean, they're everywhere, aren't they? They're all over the place. And and, and so was in in, uh, the Middle East in Jesus' day, a very common little bird, right? Um, Why would someone buy a sparrow? Well, in those days, that was the cheapest of the birds you could buy for food. Just as in big cities today, back then, there were vendors who would sell very cheap food, and often the only food that very poor people could afford. And yes, they would sell sparrows for food. They would roast them on a little spit, and once you've got that thing plucked and roasted, he's barely a mouthful. You know, there he is, on, on the, like the size of a cherry, not much bigger than that, and pop him into the mouth, and they'd crunch on him, bones and all. And he's barely a mouthful of food. And very, very cheap, right? He says that you get two birds for a coin of small value. And as we know, that coin is is a very tiny coin. It's worth a fraction of a cent, perhaps, right? So for one of those little coins, you get two of these birds. Now, Jesus later said that if you were willing to spend two coins, how many birds would you get? Now, you think that's easy math, right? For one coin, I get two. So for two coins, even I can do two plus two, right? Wouldn't that be four birds? But that's not what Jesus said. He said, if you're willing to spend two coins, you get five. What does that mean? That means that very often they'd throw one in for free, right? You've heard of the deal, right? Buy two, get one free, right? It's very similar to that, right? So what was Jesus saying then about the sparrow? He was not talking about how he viewed the sparrow or how his father viewed the sparrow. He's talking about how humans viewed the sparrow. He was saying to you, to people here, you think it's worthless, And so it was. Humans valued them as worthless and took them for granted. But then there's the contrast. How did he view them? How did his Father in heaven view them? Does Jehovah say they're worthless? Well, what did Jesus say? He said here, not one of them falls to the ground without your Father's knowledge. They fall to the ground without our knowledge because we don't care. (laughs) We don't value them. But he's saying that to Jehovah, they are valued. They are precious. They are wonderful living creatures. And if you stop and watch a sparrow, study a sparrow, watch them building a nest. Watch the mother guarding her young. Watch the parents flying back and forth and exhausting them to feed those little chicks. Watch a sparrow in flight. If you had all the money in the world and you set up an institution, a foundation, and you could pay all the greatest scientists and biochemists and engineers and gave them all the limitless funds, all the Bill Gates funds and more, and said, here, guys, all the assets you ever need, I want you to build me a sparrow. Could they do it? No. They couldn't build you a sparrow, right? They really couldn't even fully explain the sparrow to you because it's a wonderful creation of Jehovah God, and it has value to Jehovah So see, Jesus setting up a contrast. You may see it as worthless, but it isn't worthless. In reality, to Jehovah, it is a precious living thing, and we shouldn't take it for granted. And so now we get ready for the contrast, right? He says in verse 30, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. So now we get the point, don't we? Jesus is saying if that little sparrow has real value to Jehovah, 
How much worth do you have? You're worth more than many of them. He says something about us that he would never say about the sparrows or any of the animal creations. He says, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. What does that mean? The average human head sprouts about 100,000 hairs. But of course that varies with the color of your hair. Redheads have more, I think. Brunettes have less. I forget how it all goes. And of course as the years pass, we have fewer hairs. Isn't that true? So what does that mean? That Jehovah knows how many hairs are on our head? Well, sure, but that's not what Jesus is saying. He says the very hairs are all numbered. Which means on a given day when you lose 50 to 100 hairs, Jehovah knows which ones you lost, you see. He knows that you lost hair number 67,564 and also number 67, right? Now, is that an exaggeration? Is that just a hyperbole? Wow, he's just trying to make a point. Well, no, not, not really. Think about it. What hope do we all cherish in the event that we might die? We all cherish and believe and will stake our lives on the hope of the resurrection, right? What does that mean? That means that we count on Jehovah's memory, right? Jesus connects resurrection to memory. He refers to the dead as being in the memorial tombs, as being in Jehovah's memory, right? What does that mean? That when Jehovah has to resurrect us, he must remember everything about us. To remember you, Jehovah has to remember your entire genetic code. I think of the scientists with their fleets of supercomputers spending, spending years just to map out the human genome, the genetic code. There are billions and billions of pieces of information in your genetic code, and yet to recreate you, remembering your genetic code is just the beginning. Because you're not just a body with a certain height and hair color and eye color and so forth, mole here and there and so forth. No, you are so much more than that. To recreate you, Jehovah has to remember everything that ever happened to you even the things that you have forgotten. Your senses are feeding your brain about 100 million bits of information every second. And a lot of that becomes a part of you. A lot of things you barely notice are actually lodged away somewhere in there, somewhere in, there in your mind. Have you ever caught an odor of a perfume and a memory came flooding back to you? Oh, that was my grandmother's perfume. I haven't thought of her in years. You see, that was in there. It's part of you, part of who you are. So think of it, Jehovah has to remember all of that in order to recreate you. Remembering your hairs, the number of them and which ones, that's nothing compared to the mountain of information that Jehovah must remember. So what does all that teach us? Directly teaches us that you have value in the eyes of Jehovah God, an enormous value, really. Let's look at the second truth we can use to combat this lie. The second truth is that the Bible teaches us what Jehovah values in us. It teaches what Jehovah values in us. And we can break that into two aspects, our qualities and our works. Let's consider our qualities first. Please turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and verse 9. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. It says there in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a complete heart and with a delightful soul, for all hearts Jehovah is searching, and every inclination of the thoughts he is discerning. Isn't that amazing? I never cease to wonder at that scripture. Think of it, Jehovah searches every heart. There are six billion people on this planet, and Jehovah searches through every heart. What is he looking for? He's looking for good qualities. And if you think about that, what qualities are good in his eyes? Well, he's looking for people who want to know the truth. People who want to know who he is. Want to learn about who made us. Who made this beautiful planet? Who made these wonderful creations, including the sparrows? People who want to know his name. Want to know his will. When Jehovah searches through six billion human hearts, how often does he come across those qualities? People who love truth and want to know the truth. Well, we have a little inkling about how often it happens, right? Because we go out into the community going door to door and we look for people just like that with those rare qualities. How often do we find such evidence of such hearts? Well, it's rare, isn't it? If you had the job of sifting through a mountain of sand and you were told there are tiny diamonds in there, just the size of a grain of sand, and you have to sift through every grain in order to find the diamonds. If you had to sift through a thousand grains of worthless silica to get to that diamond, can you imagine how thrilled you'd be when you found the diamond? <laughs> It'd be exciting, wouldn't it? Think of Jehovah sifting through a thousand hearts to find just one like yours. 
And you know you have those qualities. That's why you're here today. That's why we come to meetings, because we want to know who Jehovah is. We want to learn about him. We want to learn how to please him, walk in his ways. Those good qualities are extremely rare. And when Jehovah sees them, he's thrilled. He's delighted. And he never forgets, as we'll learn. Let's go on then to our works. What works is he looking for as he sifts through people, as he observes people? Well, our works that we do that he values would include really anything we do that is an effort to imitate his son, Jesus. Anything that we're doing where we're trying to follow in Jesus' footsteps, that is a work that Jehovah sees and a work that he values. And the Bible lists a number of them. Here's one that we're very familiar with. If you turn to Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, Romans 10, 15. The Apostle Paul says there, How in turn will they preach unless they have been sent forth, just as it is written? How comely are the feet of those who declare good news of good things. Here Paul was quoting from a prophecy in the Hebrew Scriptures. And in both cases, of course, this is Jehovah's feeling being expressed. How comely, how beautiful are the feet of those bringing good news. Now, do you have comely feet? <laughs> You're laughing, right? Well, you know, if you just had a pedicure today, maybe, you know, you feel like you have beautiful feet, then I'm happy for you. But most of us, the fact is we're happy to cover our feet with socks and shoes, and we don't tend to bare our feet, and other people are sometimes grateful that we don't bare our feet because we don't view them as necessarily very comely. Isn't that true? Well, what is Paul saying? Is he talking about how manicured our feet are? No, the fact is Paul's words here, Jehovah's thought here, um, applies to those with no feet, people who have lost their feet, people with mangled feet, people whose feet are crippled and don't work at all. How could that be? Because he's speaking here, in a sense, symbolically, of those who act as messengers. He's talking about the feet of those who bring good news. Remember back in the old days, in, in the days when Paul wrote this, that people didn't have telephones, let alone cell phones or faxes and newspapers and TV, and so they depended on messengers to bring them all the news. And if they had family in another city and they were eager to hear from them and they were eager for some good news, perhaps of a birth or a happy event among their relatives, they would wait on the city wall and look for the messenger. And when they see him coming over the hillside, they bless his feet, right? Bless the feet that brings me the, that good news. And that's how Jehovah is speaking here. He's saying, when you bring the good news, the greatest good news, the good news about Jehovah's kingdom to anybody, by any means, whatever, whether you're using your literal feet or not, maybe you're using the telephone, right? Maybe you're uh, using letter writing. Uh, maybe you're in a wheelchair and conveying the good news by whatever means you can. However it is, see, Jehovah is saying, you have beautiful feet. What he's saying is that work you're doing is beautiful to Jehovah. He values it. It's, it's precious to him. But it's not the only work that he sees and that he values. There are many other works that we do in imitation of Jesus that we should not forget about. Here's one, for example, that people often forget all about and don't work, view as a work at all, and yet is really one of the greatest of them all. Now think of Proverbs 27, 11. Now here's a scripture that most of Jehovah's Witnesses know by heart. And here we have, in effect, Jehovah saying to us, Be wise. Make my heart rejoice that I may make a reply to him that is taunting me. Now we know that Jehovah there is speaking as a father, isn't he? And he's saying that Satan is ridiculing me, right? Because he says that none of you will stay faithful. So what does it mean for us to be wise? Primarily, it means to endure. Every day of your life, Satan does something. His system does something to try to persuade you to quit, to stop trying to get off the road that Jehovah has laid out before you. And every day that you refuse to do that, you have endured. And endurance is a beautiful and precious work, a work that Jehovah values. And think of it, Jehovah's own son said, he that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. This is one of the greatest of all the works that Jehovah asks of us. So some days we look back on the day as a nothing, as a write-off, as a failure. Oh, I, I, what a waste of a day. Did you endure? Are you still faithful at the end of the day? That, too, is a work, a work that Jehovah sees, a work that counts with him, a work that he values. Third truth that we'll use to combat this lie that we're worthless. Jehovah sifts. Jehovah sifts the good from the bad. 
And it's important that we do these in this order because when people start hearing about, well, good works and good qualities, a lot of people who are feeling bad about themselves start putting up walls, defenses, and saying, well, it's not really true about me, you know, because I'm not out in service as much as I should be, or I don't have the beautiful qualities that sister so-and-so has or brother so-and-so has. And people start thinking in terms of comparing with one another. But that's not how Jehovah sees us. He doesn't compare us with one another. He looks at us as individuals. And as he looks at us, he sifts. He's looking for the good, and he sifts the good from the bad. And this is so important for us to understand. The Watchtower, back in April 1st of 1995, made a beautiful comment on Psalm 139. Do you know in Psalm 139 where David talks about how Jehovah knew him so thoroughly? In Psalm 139, verse 3, for example, David says to Jehovah, You have searched through me. He says, My journeying and my lying down, you have measured off. David was confident that Jehovah knew him that thoroughly, that Jehovah had uh, searched through him, measured out all his journeyings and so forth. But the Watchtower commented on that scripture and said something very interesting about this expression. It said, that expression means to winnow out all the chaff and to leave all the grain, to save all that is valuable. So here it means that God, as it were, sifted David. He scattered all that was chaff or all that was valueless and saw what was there that was real and substantial. We had a circuit overseer who illustrated this beautiful point because a lot of people today aren't that familiar with chaff and grain. We don't necessarily live in an agricultural society. Not all of us work on a farm. And the circuit overseer, knowing that, he had two little black cards and pasted to the card, he had one that was just chaff and the other was a grain of wheat. And he said, see now, With wheat, you've got a lot of this junk that you don't want. And the process of winnowing or sifting, they would thresh it and toss it in the air, and the wind would blow the chaff away. And what was valuable, the wheat would drop down, and they could keep it. And he said, you see, here you have wheat. That's what Jehovah sees. He sees the good, the grain, what's valuable in us. The chaff, he throws it away. Sadly, he made the point, though, that a lot of us look at ourselves, and all we see is the chaff. We sift, too but we do it in the opposite way from Jehovah. We look at ourselves and we see only the faults, only the problems. That is not how Jehovah thinks. And our goal is to try to think more and more as Jehovah does. So we need to sift in the same way, you see, not just focusing on faults, not just focusing on our weaknesses or our problems. Let's look at two examples that show that Jehovah does exactly this, that Jehovah does sift. Uh, First, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 14. This is an interesting case. It's a little bit on the negative side, but still it teaches us something so important. In 1 Kings chapter 14, we learn about the just execution of an entire dynasty, a wicked family. The family of the wicked king Jeroboam was all to be wiped out completely. In fact, in 1 Kings um, 14 and verse 10, it speaks of this calamity, and it says, Every male would be wiped out from this family, it Says, and it says, I will indeed make a clean sweep behind the house of Jeroboam, just as one clears away the dung until it is disposed of. That's how awful and worthless this family was, because of their wickedness, because of their fighting against Jehovah and his purposes. He says that they won't even get a decent burial, these people. That's how bad they had become, you see, and they were causing such problems uh, among his people who were supposed to be serving him. However... In this huge family, this dynasty, Jehovah makes one exception when it comes to this matter of the burial. And you'll notice that exception in verse, I think it's 14. Let me just double check. Uh, Verse 13. It speaks of one exception there, and the young man's name was Abijah. And it says here in verse 13, And all Israel will indeed bewail him and bury him, because this one alone of Jeroboam's will come into a burial place, for the reason that something good toward Jehovah, the God of Israel, has been found in him in the house of Jeroboam. Now, it's easy to misread that verse. We may think that, okay, so there was at least one faithful person. There was one righteous person in that wicked family, and he was really trying to serve Jehovah. No, 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 no. He was executed along with that whole wicked family. Jehovah never executes the righteous along with the wicked. So, yes, he was part of the same problem. But what did Jehovah say there? He said, something good has been found in him. Isn't that remarkable? So Jehovah Jehovah says, here's an exception. Give him a decent burial, a memorial tomb, assurance to others. You see that Jehovah would remember this one. 
Jehovah looks for good even in those not serving him. He's looking for even the smallest good. He sees it and he values it. In fact, the Watchtower quoted uh, from one commentary about this verse, and it says, where there's but some good thing of that kind, it will be found. God seeks it and sees it, be it ever so little, and is pleased with it. Isn't that comforting? We're certainly better off than Abijah. We're not wicked people. We're not uh, due to be executed, slated for execution. But let's look at a more positive example. Let's look at a faithful servant of Jehovah who made a pretty serious mistake. Uh, the case of Jehoshaphat. Let's turn to Second Chronicles chapter 19. Now in Second Chronicles 19, we find this. One of the best of the kings of Judah who's gotten into some problems because he has allied himself with a wicked apostate king, Ahab, and he has helped him out in battle. And that was not Jehovah's will for him. And Jehoshaphat should have known better. So in verse 2, you see him coming in for a rebuke. Start there about in the middle of the verse there. Here's the message from Jehovah. Is it to the wicked that help us to be given? And is it for those hating Jehovah that you should have love? And for this, there is indignation against you from the person of Jehovah. My, that's a frightening thought, isn't it? The sovereign of the universe is indignant, is angry with you. That's the message to Jehoshaphat. How do you think he felt? He probably felt like shrinking down to the size of a pea and scurrying away, right? But we have to remember that Jehovah thinks in a way that's far, far loftier than the way you and I think. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that when we're mad at somebody, we're really mad, we're heated up, it's hard to see any good in the person at that moment. Isn't it true? And really, when we're mad at ourselves, the same is often true. We can't see any good in ourselves. But that's because sometimes our temper just gets out of control and it's hard for us to keep our balance. That's not the case with Jehovah. Even when angry with Jehoshaphat, had he forgotten the good in Jehoshaphat? Look at the next verse. Jehovah says, Nevertheless, there are good things that have been found with you. And then he goes on to list some of the good things that Jehoshaphat had done. You see, Jehovah sifts. He saw the mistake. He's not blind to errors. He's not a permissive parent, right, who just pretends that the mistakes are not there. No, he saw it, and he wanted Jehoshaphat to correct it, but he never lost sight of the good. He sifted Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was repentant for that mistake, of course, and so Jehovah put it away and uh, guarded or kept the good that Jehoshaphat had done. Yes, Jehovah sifts, and it's so important for us to, to remember that he does that. But what does he do with the good that he does? As we said, the bad, he wipes out, he gets rid of it with the good. Well, you live in an area where there's a lot of panning for gold over the years, isn't it true? And what does someone panning for gold do? They may crouch for hours by the side of the river panning for gold, and they get a lot of gravel in that pan. They find a nugget among the gravel. They're quick. They grab the nugget. What happens to the gravel? It's gone, right? That's how Jehovah sifts, right? The nuggets, the good works, the good qualities, he saves, he keeps, and he never lets them go. Can we really say that? He never lets them go? Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 has the answer. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. Beautiful, familiar words. Let's read the first part of that verse. It says there in Hebrews six ten, For God is not unrighteous so as to forget your work and the love you showed. For his name. Isn't that amazing? Jehovah doesn't only tell us here, I remember. He says he is not unrighteous so as to forget. He would view it as unrighteousness on his part to forget any of the good works that we have done or the good qualities that we have strived to cultivate in our life. He would view it as unrighteousness. Is he capable of unrighteousness? It's completely out of the realm of possibility. He never forgets. Why? Why? Well, parents, I think, know why. Because parents can't help it. Isn't it true? It's the strongest kind of love that you experience in life. Many parents have, have told me that. And Jehovah is a parent. And just to illustrate, my wife was helping uh, my mother go through some old papers and things of my grandmother, my father's mother. And among the things that she found was this ancient yellowed little card about this big. And you know what it was? It was a report card. And it was about 100 years old. And it said things on there about how little Gene is a nice boy, but sometimes he's forgetful and does this and does that. And I looked at this thing, and I thought, why on earth would anybody keep this stupid piece of paper for a hundred years? The answer, in a word, mothers, they can't help it. 
They just can't, right? His mother was so proud of her little boy and his report card and the good that he did that she kept that thing to the end of her days. Now, long after he had grown up and would be embarrassed even at the mention of this stupid report card from third grade, she still clung to that little thing. She could never let it go. And then, of course, her daughter found that and felt bad about her mother keeping it all those years, so she kept it all her days, too. So it's probably still around to this day. Ask my wife. But um, how many of us have seen our parents stow away in some drawer somewhere those silly little drawings that we did at five or six that they stuck onto the refrigerator, right, and, and kept them, or school papers or report cards? That's how parents are. They just love their children, and they cling to the good in them. Jehovah is the ultimate parent. He never lets go, never forgets the good that he sees in us. We have to remember that sometimes we sift in the opposite way, that sometimes we forget all the good and just hang on to the bad and beat ourselves up over it for years and years and years. And if so, we're not thinking the way Jehovah does. There's something else that Jehovah does, though, in sifting when he looks at us. And this is really beyond our ability, but it's so reassuring that he does it. He looks past our weaknesses past our imperfections, and sees our potential. And that is kind of mind-boggling, that he can do that, because none of us really have the ability to do that. Uh, the Draw Close to Jehovah book, and we'll be studying this in a couple of weeks, but it makes this point so nice. I thought I'd just read you this illustration. It's from the chapter after the one we're studying now, uh, chapter 24. But it, the paragraph reads this way. It says, People who love works of art will go to great lengths to restore badly damaged paintings or other works. When, for example, in the National Gallery in London, England, Someone with a shotgun damaged a Leonardo da Vinci drawing that was worth some $30 million. Imagine someone went into the National Gallery with a shotgun and shot a Leonardo da Vinci drawing. Now, what the drawing had ever done to him, I don't know. But what happened? It says, it says no one suggested that since that drawing was now damaged, it should be thrown out. No. Work to restore that nearly 500-year-old masterpiece began immediately. Why? Because it was precious in the eyes of art lovers. And then the book brings the point home. It says, are you not worth more than a chalk and charcoal drawing? In God's eyes, you certainly are, however damaged you may be by inherited imperfection. That's a powerful illustration, isn't it? Jehovah sees the damage. We have the shotgun blast, and the evidence is there, right, in every day of life. We sin. We make mistakes. And Jehovah's not blind to that. He sees it. But he sees past the damage. He sees our potential. Just as those men who knew how to restore that masterpiece knew exactly what they were going to do. They knew exactly what it was supposed to look like. They had all the tools, all the technology. They knew they could restore it to its original condition and perhaps even, even, even better, cleaning it up and restoring some of the damage that had accrued over the years, you see. And they could hardly wait. They couldn't wait to get their hands on that masterpiece and get to work. Well, the faithful slave is telling us that's how Jehovah feels about us. He knows we're damaged goods. He sees all that. But he knows what we will be when he's finished with us, when he's finished the restoration work, he knows what a masterpiece we were originally designed to be. He knows what we'll be like when we're there again, when we're perfect. He knows what you'll be like at the end of the thousand-year reign if you just stay with him. He knows what talents and abilities you have locked away in you that you don't even have a clue you possess. If you have some gift as a musician, as an artist, as an architect, as an engineer, as a zoologist, who knows? It may be in there and you've never had an opportunity even to look at that in yourself. But Jehovah sees it. He's eager to bring you to that point, to restore you. So is it worth it to him to work through your imperfections and problems in the meal? Absolutely. He makes that point very clear. Yes, Jehovah sees the good in us and he sifts. Fourth point, fourth truth. Jehovah proves, proves that he loves us. He proves it in ways that we can't argue with, proves it in very powerful, incontrovertible ways. For example, he draws us. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Please, Jeremiah 31, 3. Jehovah says there, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, From far away, Jehovah himself appeared to me, saying, And with a love to time indefinite I have loved you. That is why I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jesus said something similar in John 6, verse 44. He said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. What does it mean? To, to make a sketch of us? Draw in that sense? No, of course not. To draw means to pull. So Jehovah is saying there through Jeremiah and then through his own son, telling us, I pull you. 
I pull you toward myself and my son. How does Jehovah do that? How does he pull us toward himself? Really, in two very powerful ways. One is he has set up an organization to function in these last days. And he set it up and designed it to function in a very specific way. To reach people as individuals. There is no crystal palace. There is no TV ministry designed to reach the masses. There is a ministry designed for teachers to sit down in people's homes and teach them the truth of God's word. One on one. And that is how you and I learn the truth, right? Somebody took the time and taught us and dealt with our problems, our challenges, our questions one on one. Jehovah set up his organization to work that way for a reason, right? Because he wants to draw us. He wants to pull us. And that is the most effective way to do it. That's how his son did it when he was on the earth. That's how his people are doing it today. And uh, that is powerful evidence that he loves us. But he draws us in a second way too. Because as someone taught you, studied with you, you had problems, didn't you? We all did. There were obstacles. There were questions. We said, oh, I can't get around this one. You know this thing you people do about going door to door? Uh-uh, that's not me. Never going to happen. You know? Or this, this thing you teach about blood, I- I'm never going to buy into that. You know? Or whatever it might have been. And yet we were still willing to learn, still willing to try. And so what happened? Jehovah pulled. He pulled. He used the most powerful force in the universe, His Holy Spirit. And it worked in our mind, in our heart, because we were willing and wanted to know the truth. And He helped us over the bump in a very personal way. He drew us. You might think of a parent and a child, and the child is upset, hurt perhaps, and the parent wants to draw the child in for a reassuring embrace. And at first the child is so confused and upset that they, 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 they kind of pull away. And the parent gently overcomes the resistance. And it reaches a certain point, and the child gives up and flings himself into his parent's arms, right? Well, so it is with Jehovah, right? He, he draws us and he helps us overcome our little bit of resistance. And most of us can look back over the years and realize that Jehovah has pulled us along. He's used his Holy Spirit, and he's done it in a personal way, in a powerful way. Second way that he's proved his love for us, he listens. He listens. And isn't that what we ask of our friends? And this fact is, isn't it often what we value the most in our friends? That they will listen to us. But if you had a friend come to you and say, you know what, I have a serious problem, I need to talk to you. Now, if you love your friend, you say, okay, let's take some time. You sit down, and your friend talks with barely drawing a breath for three hours straight. And you you do your best. You know, you listen, and you try not to let your eyes glaze over, and you try not to let your mind wander. And, you know, and after three hours, you almost feel beaten up. You're exhausted, right? And your friend says, thank you. This really, really helped. And you know what? I need to do this every day. So tomorrow, I'm going to be here for another three hours. And now you're just trying to smile and think, you know what? I don't know if I can do this. Right? Because we just don't have the time and the resources that we'd like to be able to help that much. But think about Jehovah. Does he say to us, you know what, you can talk. I mean, I'll listen, but I only have a certain amount of time. And then, you know, that's, what does he say? How many of us know First Thessalonians 5.17 by heart? He says, pray incessantly. Now, that's not a command. He's not telling us you have to pray 24-7, right? He's saying, My ears are open and the door is open and there is no limit to how much you want to talk to me, how much you can talk to me. I I will not put that limit on you. Put it on yourself, right? But he is wide open and he says we can talk all we want and he will listen. And what kind of a listener is he? Have you ever talked to somebody and had the feeling that they were not listening? You notice their eyes wandering? Maybe they're kind of bouncing up and down on their toes or looking at their watch. What if they start whistling? (laughs) This is not the kind of listening that you want, is it, right? But what you want when someone listens to you is empathy. You want someone who will kind of feel for you and empathize with you, right? Is that the kind of listener that Jehovah is? Does he empathize with us? The Watchtower raised that question back in 1997. It answered with one word, absolutely. And then it went on. It said, for instance, we read regarding the sufferings of his people Israel at Isaiah 63, verse 9. During all their distress, it was distressing to him. Jehovah did not merely see their troubles. He felt for the people. Just how intensely he feels is illustrated by Jehovah's own words to his people, recorded at Zechariah 2, verse 8. Do you know that scripture? He that is touching you is touching my eyeball, Jehovah says. 
And as we learned recently in the Draw Close book, there were some so-called scholars that actually tried to change that verse and take it away from us in a sense. They said that, you know, most Bibles, by the way, go to a bookstore and look at the Bibles. Look at Zechariah 2.8. You'll see again and again and again it's translated wrong. They have God saying there, he who is touching you is touching his own eyeball. Took away the point. Because the Sophorim, these Jewish scholars, centuries ago said, oh, no, that's not dignified to say that about God. Let's change it. Imagine robbing us of that beautiful truth. No, this is what Jehovah is saying. When you hurt, I hurt. He takes it very personally. He empathizes with us. And that is the definition of empathy. The Watchtower published uh, the words of a dear older brother who defined it that way. He said, empathy is your pain in my heart. And that's how Jehovah is when he listens to us. Is that not proof? of his love. And we could go on and on, right, with proof of his love. We could think of the forgiveness that he offers us, the proof of his love, and how many ways he illustrates that he completely wipes out our sins and completely forgives us. We could talk about his goodness. We could talk about his compassion. And we could go on and on about the ransom that he gave his only begotten son, the most powerful proof of all of his love contained in John 3.16. We're going to talk about that more tomorrow, though. Let's just conclude with a few minutes to talk about that third question, which is what is the value of having a balanced view of ourselves? What what value does it have? And we emphasize the word balanced because balance is so rare in today's world. And what we are promoting here, what Jehovah's Organization is promoting, is a balanced view of ourselves. We have not seen Jehovah's Organization jump on the self-esteem bandwagon, right? People have turned self-esteem almost into a religion in itself, right? And people go to this wild and crazy extreme of worshiping the self and and just almost exalting the self. And, you know, you can only say uh, positive things about yourself ever, and there's no self-criticism at all. And that really leads to pride and egotism. That's not helpful. That's not balanced. And, of course, that's not something that we would promote. A pride and vanity are also weapons of Satan, right? And they have felled many people. Of course, we wouldn't call those secret weapons necessarily because they're kind of out there in the open, aren't they? But dangerous nonetheless, and we must resist them as well. No, what we want is a balanced view of ourselves. We think of uh, Paul's words, for example, of um, uh, soundness of mind and not thinking more of ourselves than it is necessary to think, as he mentioned in Romans 12 and verse 3. So having some estimate of ourselves, a balanced view of ourselves, is necessary, Paul says, is necessary for soundness of mind. If we think that we're worthless and have no value at all, that's not sound thinking. It's not balanced, and we must uh, fight against it. But, of course, we think, too, of Jesus' own words when uh, he talked about um, we must love our neighbor as ourself. So here's no lesser an authority than Jesus himself saying, we must have some love of self in a balanced way. Without it, it's almost impossible to love others and even to have a healthy relationship with Jehovah God. So this balanced love of self, a balanced view of ourself is essential in our service to Jehovah. It's essential to our joy. It's essential uh, to enduring and staying faithful to Jehovah. So we must have it. We must work on it. But when we do have it, what are the effects? What's the value? We're motivated to gain that balanced view if we understand the benefits of it or the value of it. So we might just have an illustration that will help us to understand. We talked a bit earlier about teachers, didn't we, and how they can have a negative effect on their students by having a negative view on them and kind of hammering at them with this negative view. We had a teacher explain that to us. Let's go to another teacher, another woman teacher, who has a rather different account. And I think you'll see that this, too, is a sad story but it has a much happier ending than the one we talked about earlier. Uh, She called her article Three Letters from Teddy. And she says, I'm just going to read you excerpts. She said that it was early in her career. She'd only been teaching for two years. And she says, from the first day that he stepped into my classroom, I disliked Teddy. She says, teachers aren't supposed to dislike any of their students, but this little boy, she disliked. Why? She's not totally sure, but she says he, he was dirty. Not just occasionally, but all the time. She was a neat freak, I think. But uh, she says his hair hung low over his ears, and he actually had to hold it out of his eyes when he wrote his papers in class. And she said he also had a peculiar odor about him that I could never identify. She said his physical faults were many, and his intellect left a lot to be desired also. She said by the end of the first week I knew he was hopelessly behind the other students. 
He was just plain slow, I said to myself. And she said, I began to withdraw from him immediately. She says, ashamed as I am to admit it, I took perverse pleasure in using my red pen on all of his papers. She said, each time I came to Teddy's papers, the X marks, and they were many, were always a little larger and a little redder than necessary. Poor work, I would write with a flourish. She says, she never stooped to, to ridiculing the boy, but she said, my attitude was obviously quite apparent to the class because he quickly became the class goat, the outcast, the unlovable and the unloved. She says, he knew I didn't like him, but he didn't know why. Nor did I know, then or now, why I felt such an intense dislike for him. All I know is that he was a little boy no one cared about, and I made no effort in his behalf. Well, the time came for a vacation, and um, she was noticing that this boy was doing very, very poorly in his studies, and she was giving him very bad grades, and she was thinking, he's going to flunk. He's going to have to repeat the grade. So to make herself feel better, she went to the files, the folders with his record. And she noticed that he had very low grades for his first four years, but not grade failure. How he had made it, I didn't know. But she says, here's what the remark said. First grade, Teddy shows promise by work and attitude, but has poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother, terminally ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a pleasant boy, helpful but too serious. Slow learner. Mother passed away at end of the year. Fourth grade, very slow but well-behaved. Father shows no interest. As she read these remarks and she says to her shame, she closed her mind to those personal remarks. She said to herself, well, they passed him four times, but he will certainly repeat fifth grade. It will do him good, I said to myself. Well, vacation time came, and the last day of class, all the students had given the teacher a gift, as is often the custom. And she says, there on her desk were many gifts heaped up. And she went through them as the class sat there. And she says, his gift wasn't the last one I picked up. And in fact, it was in the middle of the pile. Its wrapping was a brown paper bag, and he had colored Christmas trees and red balls all over it. It was stuck together with masking tape. For Miss Thompson, from Teddy, it read. She says, as I removed the last bit of masking tape, two items fell to the desk. A gaudy rhinestone bracelet with several stones missing and a small bottle of dime store cologne, half empty. I could hear the snickers and whispers, she says. I wasn't sure I could look at Teddy. Isn't this lovely, I asked, placing the bracelet on my wrist. Teddy, would you help me fasten it, she said. He smiled shyly as he fixed the clasp on her wrist, and he held the teacher's wrist up for all of the children to admire. She says there were a few hesitant oohs and ahs, but as I dabbed the cologne behind my ears, all the little girls lined up for a dab behind their ears. And then she says the children all filed out of the classroom, shouts of see you next year and so forth, but Teddy waited at his desk. When they all left, he walked toward me, clutching his gift and books to his chest, and he said to her, you smell just like mom, he said softly. Her bracelet looks real pretty on you, too. I'm glad you liked it. Well, she says he left the room. And she says that she locked the door, sat down at her desk, and wept. And she resolved to make up to Teddy what she had deliberately deprived him of, a teacher who cared. She changed her view toward this little boy, and she changed her approach toward him. She says, I stayed every afternoon with Teddy from the end of that vacation all the way to the last day of school. She says, sometimes we worked together, sometimes he worked alone while I drew up my lessons for the next day. And you know what happened? She says, slowly but surely, he caught up with the rest of the class. She saw a definite upward curve in his grades. He didn't have to repeat fifth grade. In fact, she says, his final averages were among the highest in the class. And she knew he was moving out of state the next year, but she wasn't worried about him. She knew that he was going to do all right. That was fifth grade. She didn't hear from Teddy for seven years. Seven years later, she got a letter. Remember, this is called Three Letters from Teddy, so here they are. Seven years later, Dear Miss Thompson, the note says, I just wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my class next month. 
She sent him a card to congratulate him. She's very happy and proud. Second letter from Teddy. Now it's four years later. Dear Ms. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I was just informed that I'll be graduating first in my class. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Very truly yours, Teddy Stallard. Again, she sends him a congratulating card, a pair of cufflinks. And then some years later, the third letter. Dear Ms. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know, as of today, I am Theodore J. Stallard, M.D. How about that? I'm going to be married in July the 27th, to be exact. I wanted to ask if you could come and sit where Mom would sit if she were here. I'll have no family there, as Dad died last year. And she says, I'm not sure what kind of a gift you send to a doctor on completion of medical school, but she says, maybe I'll just take a wedding gift. But my note can't wait. She wrote him back and said, Dear Ted, congratulations. You made it, and you did it yourself. In spite of those like me and not because of us, this day has come for you. She's a little hard on herself, I think, at the very end. Don't you agree? I think that in, at first she was an obstacle to the boy. But when she changed her view of him, what happened? It helped him to change his view of himself. And when he saw that someone believed in him and someone was willing to work with him and teach him and believe that he would progress, he believed it himself. And in effect, it helped to turn his life around. That is the effect that a teacher can have in a positive sense. The great teacher, the greatest teacher of all is Jehovah God. How profound can the effect be when we understand properly how he views us? that he values us, that he sees the good in us, our good qualities, our good works, that he sifts through us and throws out the bad and keeps the good, that he sees our potential. All of these things, what effect can it have on us? Briefly, let's look at just one scriptural illustration of of the effect. Uh, Think of Isaiah. If you go to Isaiah chapter 6, you see that Isaiah went through a brief spell of feeling terrible about himself. Interestingly, it was because of a vision of Jehovah. In Isaiah chapter 6, the first verses, Isaiah has a spectacular vision of Jehovah. He says there that he got to see Jehovah in verse 1. It says, lofty and lifted up was Jehovah's skirts filling the temple. So there was Jehovah over the temple itself, and there were these mighty spirits with him in verse 2, these seraphs, and they are described as well. But the focus of this vision apparently is on the song the seraphs were singing. And do you see the theme of it in verse 3? These angels were singing, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of armies. Stressing Jehovah's holiness, his purity, his cleanness. And what effect did that have on Isaiah? The first effect is it reminded him of how unholy, how unclean he was. He says there um, in verse 4, woe to I'm sorry, verse 5, right? Woe to me, for I am as good as brought to silence, because a man unclean in lips I am, and in among a people unclean in lips I am dwelling. He feels how dirty he is compared to Jehovah God, and he just shrinks up and feels low and worthless, powerless for a time. Did Jehovah leave him there? No. He sends one of these mighty angelic beings, the seraph, and the seraph performs an unusual act. He takes a coal from the altar of the temple and he touches it to Isaiah's lips. Now you might think that sounds more painful than comforting, (laughs) have a hot coal pressed against your lips. But Isaiah very well knew the symbolism. That altar was where sacrifices were offered up for atonement for sin. That altar represented to Jehovah's people that they had the opportunity to be clean, to be holy in Jehovah's eyes. And so as Isaiah said, I'm unclean in lips. Most of our sins come through the way we talk, use our mouth, right? But The angel, the seraph, rather, is saying to him, no, no, you can be clean in Jehovah's eyes. You are clean in Jehovah's eyes because your sins are forgiven you. You repent, you see. And what effect did that have on Isaiah? Now, when he's saying in verse 5, woe to me, he's, he's not ready for action. There's nothing he can do. When we feel that way about ourselves, we're powerless and paralyzed. But after Jehovah did this wonderful thing for him, reminded him that he was clean and precious in his eyes, Jehovah then asks, for, an assign- for someone to fulfill an assignment. In verse 8, I began to hear the voice of Jehovah saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And did Isaiah say, Not me, Jehovah. I'm worthless. I'm unclean. No. He says, Here I am. Send me. Having a balanced, proper view of himself gave him strength. And he was ready for action now. 
And so it can be for us, friends. When we understand how Jehovah views us, if we fight against this lie that Satan wants us to swallow, that we're worthless or have no value, if we understand how Jehovah really sees us, we can be full of strength and energy and zeal to go forward in the work and to help other people to understand how Jehovah really feels about them. So in conclusion, friends, we'd like to just read one more little paragraph from the Draw Close book. We'll be reading this in a couple of weeks, but it's worth reviewing. Uh, Chapter 24 ends with these words. It says, Let each of us do everything in our power to resist all the ideas that Satan promotes in this dying old world. That includes rejecting the thought that we are worthless or unloved. If life in this system has taught you to see yourself as an obstacle too daunting even for God's immense love to surmount, or your good works is too insignificant even for his all-seeing eyes to notice, or your sins is too vast even for the death of his precious son to cover over, you have been taught a lie. Reject such lies with all your heart. Let us keep ever in mind the inspired words of the Apostle Paul, Romans 8, 38 and 39. Don't we love those scriptures there? Paul says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor governments, nor things now here, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation that will be able will be able to separate us from God's love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You must know this. You have a Father, and He loves you. You must know this. And each of us must do two things with that truth. Number one is accept it, which means if we have a hard time believing it, we need to have a little Bible study with ourselves. Meditate on this question. Use chapter 24 of the Draw Close book or other material that the faithful slave has prepared. Pray over every scripture as you read it and have a little study with yourself and help sound this truth down into your heart so you know it, so you accept it. We must know this truth. Not believing it is to deny the value of the ransom. It stabs at the heart of the truth. So let us, none of us, believe this lie. Let us accept the truth. Secondly, let us return Jehovah's love. See, the point of this meeting is to teach us to accept that truth. The point of every other meeting, really, is to teach us how to return Jehovah's love, isn't it? How to show Jehovah that we love him. And the more we understand that he loves us, the more we're inclined to return that love and express our love for him. May we, each of us, be resolved to do that. And may each of us, then, be able to do as Jehovah meant for us, to bask in the love of our Heavenly Father through all eternity.